Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture two. Oh, that's not a good spot for that. We have um, so much to get through today. It's a packed two hour lecture. So um, I think we should just keep the good vibes going and um, get started with some of the content today. Um, I see a lot of you already know each other in the chat, which is awesome to see. Um, so audio is good, video is looking good. Hello everyone. Um, 3 p.m. is a bit easier to, to, to tackle, isn't it, than a 9 a.m. start yesterday. So we get a bit of both, which is really good. Um, welcome to lecture two, week one, lecture two. This isn't my class. Interesting. <laughs> um, we are going to cover some of the really fundamental basic building blocks of programming today. I'm really excited. It's going to be a lot of switching between slides and um, and live coding. So expect a bit of that. The lecture PDFs are already available. Um, so you can go download those. Someone's been, um, someone in the, linked it in the chat, which is awesome. Yes, I'm standing. Um, <laughs> is that okay? Um, cool. I'm excited. I'm really excited. Okay, we have a lot to get through today. So sit down, whether on your phone or on your laptop, um, get, get pumped, but pay attention. We have a lot to cover. If it goes a bit fast at times, that's completely okay. Um, you can always rewatch the lecture content, um, you know, to, to solidify the ideas that we talk about. I've put my audio up. Hopefully that's a bit better. Um, yeah. Okay, yep, all the lectures are recorded. You can just click the exact same link that you've clicked to view the lecture live and you'll see the recorded videos. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. So, quick recap. Recap. Yesterday, on Tuesday, we talked about um, an introduction to the course. Okay, cool, boring. Um, how does the course work? And we got started really simply building Hello World um, in, in C. Today, we're gonna to be talking about um, variables. Um, procedures, um, some maths, how we organize code, um, and conditional. So actually we're introducing a few topics today, but um, the good thing is that they're all pretty simple concepts um, that you'll be able to get your head around quite quickly. And if you don't, that's okay. That's why we have the labs, the tutorials, um, and the assignment coming up to help you solidify the ideas. So what the lecture is really designed to do is to introduce these concepts um, to you all so that they, they solidify when you, when you get working on them. So once again, you can scan this QR code or someone maybe can put the link in the chat to download all the live lecture code that we write. So as I save the files, they'll be available to you um, immediately during and after the lecture. So I'll stay on this slide for a second. Oh, my camera's cut off the URL. It's the same link as yesterday. <laughs> I'm not gonna keep moving my camera around. There's no good spot to keep my camera today, so that sucks. All right, a brief recap. Yesterday we made this Hello World program, or in this case it just says, hey, um, we include the standard IO library. This contains some functions and procedures for us to do um, some printing and reading. So that allows us to call this printf uh, function that lets us print out some strings, some text um, to the terminal and then we return zero to, to tell the program that, hey, um, this program completed without any problems. And hopefully um, you had a chance to write this C program yourself um, uh, to, to get a feel for the compiling and the saving and the writing of the code. Um, and to give you a little recap of some of the aspects here, we're saying this, this integer int refers to that this main function returns a number. It's returning the number zero or some other figure that, that details how the program successfully or unsuccessfully completed. Um, we have this void in the brackets here to indicate that the function doesn't need any input, okay? The backslash n here indicates that after I print the string hey, I wanna print a new line. It's a character escaped n which indicates new line. And they're sort of the components that make up Hello World. The first concept we're introducing today is something called procedures. Um, what is a procedure? You've sort of already seen one actually. 
um, when we wrote the main function. Um, functions and procedures are very similar uh, concepts. In fact, most C programmers never use the word procedures. They just use the word functions. But we're introducing procedures here first. So what do procedures help us do? They help us group functionality into sections of code. Because we can do this sort of grouping and labeling, it allows us to reuse code without retyping the lines over and over. And you've already sort of been introduced to it with um, the main function. So um, here's an example of a, a procedure. Um, maybe over here is a bit better. Here's an example of a procedure. Um, and let's break down sort of the different aspects of it. So a procedure is something that does something. Um, when you call a procedure, it goes off and does what you tell it to do. So all procedures um, don't return anything. They always return void. Remember, void means nothing, essentially. So go off and do this procedure. What's it going to return? Nothing. Because the procedure goes and does an action for us. Um, in this case, the procedure also accepts no parameters. So there's a void there as well. And in the body of the procedure, um, it just executes some, um, some lines of code. Um, yeah, we're going to get this person banned in the chat. That'd be fantastic. Cool. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Anyway, let's stay focused. Yep. Um, <laughs> this is how, you know, you know, you've, you've made your, your lectures when, when the bots, when the bots are coming. Okay. Um, so let's actually, before we go on, jump into our editor and use um, and write some, um, some procedures. So I've got my um, VLab open here. If you remember, I use Tiger VNC. You can log in and get access to um, uh, your, your environment here. I've opened my terminal and it's created an environment for me um, here on my desktop. Cool. Okay. Now, if we remember, um, I have some directory that I want to work out of and we can use the change directory command to, to move around the terminal and we can use the ls command to list um, my directories. So I'm going to change my directory into public HTML. That's where I'm just personally working because I want all my code um, to be available to all of you. So I type ls again. Okay, I want to go to comp. 1511, whoops, I hit the tab key to autocomplete um, and I want to move into the lecture code. So I just type CD lecture code LS and I'm just going to move into week one. Here we go. If you remember yesterday, we wrote this hello world.c program and we generated this program executable. Today, I'm going to make a new uh, file so I can go G edit. Um, and the name of the file, let's just call it my procedure dot C and the ampersand to indicate that um, I want to keep my terminal active when I edit this file. And this is going to go off and create a file for me in this location um, called my procedure dot C. It's telling me where it's opened um, and I get my empty editor here. Okay. Let's start off by creating the sort of core scaffold that all my, um, my C programs, you know, our C programs need to have. So we always start off with an int main. Okay, this is a, a, a procedure that accepts nothing. Main is special though, it has to return an integer. Um, I give it the brackets, okay, the curly braces to indicate that what I'm about to type within these braces belongs to the main function. And really, that's all I actually need um, to set up a function in C. We'll have my uh, little return zero here. This is sort of, this is a valid C program already, just like this. It doesn't do anything, um, but this is a C program. I always, I know I want to do some printing in this program, so I'm going to include um, st standard io.h. Um, now this will let me um, use printf and stuff like that. Okay, um, 
Alrighty. Maybe we need to get that <laughs> account blocked or something like that. Okay. Anyway, let's stay focused. Um, so this is a valid C program. Um, we imported standard IO, so I can use printf here um, to print um, some, some lines out to the terminal. Um, and I'm going to print, for example, um, let's see, hey, comp 1511. How are we all doing? Okay. Remember, we write our code, we always save our code, um, and then we can come over to the terminal and compile and run our program. So how do we compile? We use DCC. We give it the name of the file that we want to complete, uh, to compile. In this case, I think we called it my underscore procedure.c, and I want to output it to a program called my procedure. We'll just call it like this. I missed an F, so you can see here, I missed an F um, in my print statement, my printf statement, and the compiler actually told me, hey, um, I don't recognize this, did you mean printf? That is what I meant. So I can put the file, the F back there, save that, come back here and recompile. Yeah, so you guys caught it as quick as the compiler did. Good job. All right, so I compile that program. I get no um, message out, which is telling me that's all worked completely okay. Um, and then I can execute that program. How do I execute the program? I can list all the files in the directory. There's my my procedure. I say in the current directory, execute the program my procedure. I do that and I get, I forgot my backslash ends, but I get my string um, all printing out a okay. So let's put those backslash, backslash ends in. And now let's talk about what a procedure does and why it's powerful. So let's say I want to print these statements a few times. I don't really want to repeat, you know, these lines of code two, four, eight times. Um, I just want to say, sort of group up these, these print statements and just reuse them. How do I do that? Well, I make another um, function or procedure like main, but in this case, I'm going to call it something different. So it returns nothing, so it's called a void. It does something, but it doesn't return anything. And I'm gonna call it print hello. I can call that anything I want. I've decided to call it print hello. It also accepts no parameters, so nothing goes in the brackets. And it's gonna do something when I call it. What is it going to do? Well, I want it to actually print my print, uh, execute my printf statements. We can put those here, save that. And now what I've done is I've moved these printf statements into this new label, this new block called printello. Now, if I were to execute this to save it and compile it, um, what's it going to do? Can it, who's going to take a guess? Is it going to print out these statements or is it not going to do anything? Nada, nope, nothing, won't do anything. Well, you guys are really have a good intuition about this. Um, when a program is executed it, in C, it always starts at the main function. It jumps to the first line in main, and what does it do here? Nothing, and then it just returns zero. It doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't call print hello. How do we call a function or a procedure in C? Well, we simply just type the name of it, Oops. And that's it. The two parentheses indicates that I'm calling the function. I want to execute the function, which is going to go off and then jump to the, to the block of print hello and execute the two printf statements. So I save this file. Remember, we always save, compile, and then execute. And if we do those three steps, we can see that I'm getting back my two printf statements. But here's the really cool thing about these 
um, pr procedures and functions. If I want to print it out yet again, I can just recall it, right? I can just call it again. I save the file, I compile the program, and I execute the program. And now I get it written out tw twice. It's running that block two times. And you can imagine that if this was a, a, a procedure with many, many lines of code, um, I just have to call the label, the, the print hello function once, and, I, and it executes all of those lines of code. And it lets me reuse it, recall it. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, remember, main is a special function, a special procedure. It has to return an integer and it has to return a number to indicate that the program has exited. Whereas our procedures or our functions like print hello, um, they don't need to do that. Um, they're not expected to um, indicate that the program completed because the program didn't complete at this point. Now, so a few people have asked, what are you meant to be doing? You have a few options. You can be following along the lecture notes, the lecture PDF, um, and just listening and watching. You can try and open up your VLAB and program along with me. If you, if you think you can keep up, that's okay. Um, but you're not expected to, to necessarily be live coding as I'm live coding. Um, whatever works better for you is what you should do. There's no right or wrong approach, um, but maybe what, yeah, whatever works for you. What does it mean when main has to return a number? We don't see any number printed. That's a really good point, Joshua. Um, you're right. We don't see this zero anywhere. Whoops. We don't see the zero anywhere. It is somewhere. We're not going to talk about it right now. Um, maybe later in the course we'll talk about it. But it's telling the operating system that the program exited completely. Um, it would actually still work without the line, but it's not good practice. Okay. So you can see what a procedure is, pretty simple. It's a label and a collection of some lines of code that can be executed um, by calling that procedure's name. Any questions on the, on the procedure idea? Leo, we'll talk about how you can do things lots and lots of times in a few, in a few lectures. Yeah. So, um, John Paul, it maybe sounds like you're putting a return in your procedure. Remember, I don't have a return here. I just do some things and that's all. Um, Dorian, good question. Is there a difference between a function and a procedure? Yes and no. They all, they, you know, they're both sort of the same thing. It's the return type, the name, the parameters, the block. Um, but a procedure is just a function that doesn't return anything. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The main function, you're right, Hazard. The main function is special. It's where the program starts. It's a special um, function. Okay. That's all a procedure is, um, but they are really useful because they help us retype our code. All right. Some of you have seen this int, this int in main, and um, we want it, We need to start talking about what that means. That's what we're going to focus on in this section now. So, all of our programs so far, right? If we look at this program we've written, it it executes, it does some things, it prints some things out, it imports some information. Um, from a library, but that's it. Every time I run this program, it does the exact same thing in the exact same sequence. Um, and one of the reasons that is, is that this program doesn't actually have any use of memory. It doesn't remember anything. And our programs, when we write them, when we solve problems, um, need to remember things often. Um, and so what we need to do is learn how the computer remembers things and how we can ask the computer to remember things that we want it to remember. Um, and the way we do this is by using the random access memory of our, com of our, of our computers. Um, and the C programming language 
has a way, um, a few different ways really, um, to ask the operating system for some of this memory so that we can use it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is memory in a computer? It's not like the memory in your brains. Um, it's very simple, really. Um, memory in a machine, in a computer, is a base to series of registers, or these zeros and ones. So um, it's a big pile of on-off switches. Um, we call these switches, or these zeros and ones, bits. Um, and it's the smallest unit in computing. Um, a bit is a choice between a zero and a one. Um, but it wouldn't be very useful if all we could store was zero or one, right? Um, that would be pretty hard. So what we do in our programs, in our memory, is we group these zeros and ones, these registers or these switches, into groups, into bunches. Usually into segments of eight bits, which we call a byte. Um, and using a combination of these pieces of memory, we can represent um, we can represent values. So where exactly and how is this memory sort of, um, you know, what does it look like? How is it constituted? Um, well, the CPU, when you tell it to do something like printf, um, performs, you know, basic expressions, instructions, arithmetic, but the, the RAM, not the CPU, is what stores um, the data. Um, the RAM is actually divided into a few segments. We can briefly sort of describe it. But the two major concepts um, relevant for 1511 um, is the heap and the stack. So um, when we write our programs, it would be a lot of work if we, when we needed to store some data, we had to go ask for the individual zeros and ones. So um, the C programming language um, basically does some of that work for us. And the way it does that is with a concept called variables. Probably one of the most important concepts um, that you will cover in this course. So what is a variable? It's our way of asking the computer to remember something for us. It's called a variable because the value can change. So the variable is a piece of memory, a piece of storage, a container that values can go into and can change. Different variables are different sizes and they're constituted differently. Um, so a variable to remember a number might be different in size from a variable to remember um, a name, a string, okay? And so each variable has a specific purpose in mind. So there's different types of variables. What types of variables are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to talk about three variables today. Um, integers, characters, and doubles. So we've already seen int. If we look at our lecture slide here, we have this int here. Well, what is this talking about? In C, in the C programming language, an int is an integer or a whole number. So it's a piece of, it's a, it's a variable that can store a whole number. It's pretty, it's that simple. So it can't store 1.2 or 1.5. That's not a whole number, um, but it can store um, a, a whole number. <laughs> I'm just repeating myself, really. Um, another type is a character or a car. Um, and this is used to store a single character, like the letter A or the letter capital A, um, something like that. And finally, we'll talk about a double today, which is what we can use to store um, a floating point number. So for example, this is storing um, the value pi 3.14, etc. Um, we can't store this number in an integer, so we can create something called a double. So um, each of these variables have a different number of bits and bytes in them because they store different things, um, but they're all allocated in memory when we run the program. What's important to note about um, memory that runs um, in, in the random access memory or in the RAM is that when the program ends, we lose, um, we lose that memory. Um, Jerry, you ask a good question. What about void? You can think of void as like this thing that stores nothing. There's no memory there. It's zero. There's zero room. It's sort of a weird concept, but it, we have it because we need to put something in that placeholder. Um,
Aaron asks a good question. Do we need to care about the exact number of bytes or bits in those variables? The answer is yes and no. Most of the time when we store, for example, an age, if I want to store how, how old I am, I don't really need to think about it. I make an integer. I don't really care how big the memory allocation was. Um, and I just put my number into it. But if we're really pushing our computers or we're dealing with really big or really small numbers, um, then we do actually need to know um, the size of the memory. So that's one component of a variable. The other component of a variable is what we name the variable. We need something to refer back to it. And um, actually we've been naming things already in our programs. Um, can anyone tell me some names or some, some identifiers um, in this program here on the screen? Yeah, Nathan, main is an identifier. Exactly right. It's a special one because it has to be there, but is an identifier. And exactly right. You guys are smashing it. Print hello. That's another identifier. I decided to name this function print hello. And just like I name my procedures and my functions, we need to name our variables. And they are a small or a quick description of what the variable should be storing. Um, and you can name your variables anything, but a really good programmer is really careful about what they name um, their variables. So if I'm storing my age, what should I call that variable? Should I call it X? Should I call it Y? Um, should I call it Apple? That's quite confusing. I should call it age, right? Um, so what we name our variables is really, really important. Um, in C, in this course, we always use lowercase letters to start our variable names. Um, and our variables are case sensitive. So you can see answer with a capital W and answer are two very different. Uh, they would be two separate pieces of memory or two different identifiers. Now, some of you mentioned when I asked you um, what some of the names were, like is return a name? Is return an identifier? And it is and it isn't. Um, some names are part of the C language. So that means they're reserved. So I can't make a variable called return, for example, because that would be really confusing, right? Is it trying to return something or is it my variable called return? So some keywords are actually blocked by the C programming language and you're not allowed to use them. Um, and we can use multiple words for our variable names, but it has to be one sequence of characters. So we have to put it, for example, an underscore in between the two names. Um, what we name our variables is an art. Actually, <laughs> You know, yes, last night, it was maybe midnight, I was writing some code um, for, what was I writing for? Some, some uh, one of the projects I work on. Um, there was something I was working on. And I was working on it maybe for two hours. Um, and I reckon one half of the hour, of the two hours, one hour, was me fretting over what I was naming the variables in, in my program. Not because I was indecisive or I didn't know what to call it, but because what we name our programs is actually so important because when someone else comes and reads our code or when we read your code, we want to really communicate what it is that our variables are referring to. So we want to make our variables name something that's really obvious what they're representing. Um, so we don't want to refer to our age as Joe, for example, right? even though I did see that a few times. If someone else is skim reading your code, it should be really clear what that variable is referring to. Someone's asked what snake case is. Uh, it's just a fun little term that's used to describe when you separate your um, words with an underscore. This is snake case here. Cause it's like, it sort of looks like a snake. There's some funny terms for that. Okay. So, Let's focus in on the integer a little bit. An integer is a whole number, so no fractions, no decimals. Most commonly uses 32 bits or four bytes, so four times eight. So four sequences of eight bits, um, which gives us, if we think about it, two to, two to the 32 possible um, whole number values that we can store. So the maximum is very large, but it's not infinite. And so the exact range is, is I think, two point, is a 2.1 billion I think that is um, uh, negative to positive. 
So about 4 billion values, I think. I think that's right. For a character, it's a single um, letter. So you can't make a name from this. So we name our character variable, but it can store only a single character. Um, under the hood in the C programming language, um, a character is actually just an integer and each integer maps to a specific letter. So you can see the letter capital A is actually just the integer 65. So it's sort of like this mapping or this association between um, a, a value, a number, and the, the actual character that gets displayed. If we want to display a, a character, we have to use the letter um, surrounded by single quotes. And that's actually quite important. Um, so for example, the letter A, the character is single quote A, single quote, and the integer stored is 65. This, um, this, not, this integer to character mapping is, de is designed and described in what's called the ASCII convention. Um, so basically it's agreed that 65, for example, is always the letter capital A in any sort of environment if you're using ASCII, which we always almost do. Um, cool. And then finally we have doubles. Um, they store double precision floating point numbers, which is why they're called double. But you can just think of it as a decimal value or floating point. So for example, 10.56, 10.67, whatever. Um, it's actually keeping track of not only the actual values, so 10567, but also where the decimal point is. That's what a float or a double does for us. Um, it's called double because it's usually 64 bits, which is double that of an integer, <clears throat> which was 32 bits. Um, and so, yeah, it's double the size of our integers, which is why it's called um, a double. All right, that's a lot of talking. Maybe you'll want to re-watch that part of the lecture. But what I think is much more fun is let's just get started writing some code and storing some variables. Okay, so let's switch to my editor here. I'm going to delete my procedure. I'm going to delete my calls to that procedure, which is no longer gone. And here we have the really basic template of a C program. Now, instead of printfing, which is what we've usually been doing, um, let's store some numbers, store some variables. Okay. What's the first type that we want to store? Everyone, quick, an integer, a character, or a double? Character, character, I'm getting characters. I'm getting characters and ints. Let's do it. All right. So I want to tell, <laughs> now, oh my God, now we're flying past. I need to tell my C program, I need to tell my computer, hey, I want a piece of memory um, to store a character. So I need to tell it, hey, I want to store a character. So what do I do? I type the type, C-H-A-R. That's a special word in the C language that tells the computer, hey, I want enough bits to store a character. Now, what do I need? My name, I need to name my variable. What am I gonna name it? Um, I'm gonna name it my favorite letter and I can't type very well. So I've decided to name this variable my favorite letter. That's my identifier for it. And actually, I can stop right there. This is actually a valid C program. I can save it. I can compile it. Um, I am getting a warning, but I'm gonna ignore it for now. And I'm gonna run it and nothing happened. Okay, now why was I getting a warning? Well, the compiler was actually noticing that I made um, this variable but I never used it. So it's saying, is that, are you sure, Jake? I know you're a bit, you know, a bit thick, but is that sure you want it to do? So it, it got some memory to store um, a variable and then it did nothing with it. But this is actually really cool if we think about it. What happened here? What happened was that when I ran this pr program, we got to line four and 
this program actually asked my operating system. It went, please, could I please have some memory to store a character? Jake would just like some memory to store a character, please. And the operating system says, sure, here's, here's some memory to store a character. That's how it works. When we want memory in our programs, our programs actually ask the operating system for that memory. So the operating system's job is to actually manage who has access to what memory. Um, so that's an important idea. And that's not actually a free exercise. The act of asking the operating system for memory costs some computational cycles, but let's not worry about those. Yeah, the programs are very polite. The thing with operating systems, you've got to be very delicate. Operating systems uh, um, can be quite nasty. They can decide, hmm, you've had too much memory, I'm going to kill you. Um, you. They can say no, actually. Shrey is 100% right. What happens if your program asks for some memory, but there's none left? It just says no, and then your program will probably just die because it can't con continue. So you do have to be very polite with your operating system. Okay. So I declared, declared some memory for, an, for a car. Or I, we asked the OS for some memory. That's really all we've done here. We've asked the operating system for enough memory to store a character. But we actually haven't stored a character. We haven't used it yet. Let's use it. How do I how do I refer back to this character variable? Really, really difficult here. I don't know how. You just use the name of it. My favorite letter. In fact, my editor here knows that I probably want to refer back to that. And then how do I actually put something in that variable? Um, we use a um, something called the assignment operator, and it's actually just one equal sign in the C programming language. And then, on, and then I just type the character I want to store. What, I think my favorite letter is going to be J. In fact, it's going to be capital J because I am capital. And then we <laughs> we um, say, okay, that's the end of my statement. And that's a completely valid line of C code. So let's break down what's happening here. This is our first time we've done an assignment. This is really exciting. How assignments work, you go, you jump to the assignment statement. Um, and you say, what appears on the right, I need to put in the left. Um, and that will assign the letter J to my character. Oops. Okay. Oops. Let's compile this. I think I've done that correctly. Again, it's telling me I've not used it. That's completely fine. I haven't actually used it. I've just put the letter J, um, Oh, okay. Sorry. I was getting some messages from that because the, the tutors in the chat and I wasn't understanding what they were saying, but I understand now. Okay. Here's something really important. Um, I did mention this on the slide, but it's, it's worth repeating. So can someone tell me why I put the letter J in these single quotes? I think, yeah, that's right. You're never certain that you've done it correctly, correctly, Bonnery. And we can say, yeah, it's a string or it's a character, but, but why do we, yeah, but why do we need to do it? Oh, okay. Jay-Z block, Jay-Z, Jay-Z block or Jay-Z block. Um, you've got it. You've got it. If I didn't do this, if I just said it equals J like this, right? How would the C programming language know if I meant some function, right? Or void, whoops, void J, you know, does nothing, blah, blah, blah. How would it know the difference? 
It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't know if it's an identifier to another variable or a procedure or a function, or if I meant the character J. So what this means is um, we have to tell the somehow we need to communicate. Hey, I don't mean the identifier J. I mean the character J. And the way we store a character is with single quotes. It's just what we've decided means a character in C. Okay, so our characters need to be surrounded by um, single quotes. Okay. Now, you notice, let's clear this and rerun it. It's still telling me, hey, you've got this variable, you've put something in it, but you've not actually used it. Um, so let's go ahead and we can actually use it. What's something that you think um, I can do with a character? We want to do something with it, something that we've already been doing. Oh my, you guys are too good. Let's get the bill. Yeah, exactly. Print it, let's print it. I store the letter J. I want to print it. How do I print? I use printf as always. Um, and I got to tell it what I want to print. Now, here's, here's the reason why there's actually an F in printf. Who knows what the F stands for? What does the F stand for? Not function? Good guess though. Format. There we go. Dorian's got it. Dorian's seen this before. It stands for format. Print format. So what it's actually saying is you need to give me the format of the thing that we want to print because now we're not just printing a string. We're printing some data. We're printing a variable. And I need to tell it where to put the thing that I want to print. So for now, all I'm going to do is this. It's going to maybe not make much sense right now but I'm going to put percent %c. Why am I putting percent %c? I'm printing a character. I need to tell it, hey, I'm printing a character. Thank you so much. Um, and then what do I need to give it? The character I want to print. So does that mean I put a J here? Is that correct? Maybe, maybe, no, no, no. Now I want to put the variable name. Exactly, because I don't know exactly what is in this variable. It might have changed. Someone might have come along um, and, and, and changed it like that. Um, so I can just print my favorite letter. Now let's compile this. Oops, it's telling me I forgot my semicolon after the expression. We need to always forget, remember that, not forget that. Um, you can tell I... Um, I've been writing a lot of Python lately where you don't have to do that. I compile this program. I get no error messages because now I'm actually doing something with this letter. Um, um, my favorite letter. And then I can just run this program. And here we can see right there is the letter capital J that got printed. This is really cool. I didn't print, like I didn't type print F J here. I just typed the name of my variable. And then what the program did was it went off, it actually looked in the memory and it said, hey, um, I'm expecting a character. Um, what is in that piece of memory? And then the computer said, oh, well, it's, it's a bunch. It's a bunch of zeros and ones. And then it looked up at those zeros and ones and goes, oh, okay, those zeros and ones, they actually map to the letter J. So print the letter J to the terminal. And so yeah, all of that work and we, um, we've printed one lousy character to the terminal, but it's really cool. Um, some of you said, how do we put the new line back in? I can't put the new line here because that's like saying I want an identifier named my favorite letter backslash N. So that's not quite right. It actually goes in the first string. So it says print the character and then print a new line. If I save this, I compile this, I run this, and we get 
our character J and it followed by a new line, which means I can put sort of anything I want here in my string literal. So I can say, hey, my favorite letter is my favorite letter. I save that, I compile that, I run that, and look what we have here. All right. Here I assign the letter J to my variable. What happens if I change my favorite letter? I've changed my mind. Um, now my favorite letter is S for Shrey. I save this, I compile it. When I run this, what's it going to print? J or S or something else, I guess. Okay, you're all saying S, you're all saying S, but I put a J in it. I did put a J in it on line eight. I'm not deleting the line. Well, what happens on line nine? Well, let's break it down again. We find the assignment statement. We go to the right of the assignment statement. We evaluate the expression. Okay, here we have an S. We put that S and we actually override what was in that piece of memory with our new character. Um, integer. So we run it. Hi, hey, my favorite letter. Oh, there's an S missing there. My favorite letter is, is S. So we can create memory, assign values to memory, reassign values to memory. Um, we can do that many, many times. All right. Let's see uh, what else um, we can do. Yeah, we spoke about printfing. Why don't we print a do work with an integer? Um, and then I'll explain what the percent C is for. I'll come back to it. So I want to store an integer now. Okay. Well, what's the type um, of the data that I'm storing? I'm I'm drinking soda water. Um, what's the type of something I want to store? Yeah, I want to store an integer. I need to tell the operating system. Or the, or the program, hey, I would like some memory to store an integer. What am I going to call it? I'm not going to call it my age. Um, I'm going to call it the temperature. Semicolon to indicate that is the end of this expression. Um, this expression is, is finished. I want to put something into this variable. So I need to write the name of the identifier and assign it a number. Um, and what number will, does anyone actually know the temperature today in Sydney? Um, Matthew, you ask a good question. We'll talk about it. Okay. About, oh God, there's a wide range of numbers here. I'm saying 14 a lot. We'll just say 14. <laughs> Semicolon to indicate that that is the end of my expression. Okay, let's just say it's 14. So I've stored now the value 14 in an integer variable. How do I know it's an integer? When I declared it, I asked for an integer, which means I can print out an integer. Printf. And it is a nice um, something degrees, let's say. degrees. I'll fix up the formatting in a second here. I always have to put a comma. What's the variable that I'm trying to print? It's temperature. And I did not forget my semicolon at the end. Now, remember, it's a formatted print. It's a print format. Um, so I need to tell it with this percent idea where I want the value to actually go. And I want it to go. It's a nice um, percent D degrees. Now, why have I used percent %d here? Um, like I had to use a percent %c to say I'm printing a character, um, for a number, for an integer, we need to use percent %d. Um, how are you meant to know it's d? Why isn't it i? 
great questions. <laughs> you can ask the people that designed, designed the C programming language. Um, and you can go off and look up um, these placeholder um, sort of mappings to what, what they actually map for. But, but exactly, Kyo, um, they are just placeholders for where that variable should go. So I can save this. Uh, oh, I always forget the backslash n at the end to make it look really nice. I save this. Again, you're gonna be sick of this. I compile this um, and I execute this. Hey, my favorite letter is S and it's a nice 14 well, degrees, I guess. That's the second time I've got an S at the end of the string. All right. A few of you have been asking the same question over and over. I'm not ignoring it. Um, I'm just getting there. Declaring a variable and assigning a variable are two different things, right? Declaring a variable means you have to trot off to your operating system and please ask for a bit of memory. Um, assigning a variable, you don't need to ask the operating system for anything. You're just saying, hey, I've got some memory. I, I want to put this value, um, this value in it. We can declare a variable and assign something in the one line, in the one swoop. I've said I'm drinking soda water. It's just carbonated water, everyone. Okay. I can do this. Why am I splitting it up? Just because I want to show you all um, that it's two separate things. It's two separate activities or instructions um, that we do. It's two different things. So I want to separate it at the moment just to show you that when I can declare... Um, a variable and I can assign a variable um, separately. Okay. Um, yeah, with the Pellegrino, exactly. Um, uh, another question that's come up is why is it this percent %d um, and why is it not percent %i? You can actually use percent %i. Um, I don't think it's that valuable getting into the nuance of when you should use both. They both, both percent %d and percent %i can store an integer, um, but percent %d is actually a little bit less flexible, so it's actually what we want to use in this exact case. But um, if you're really curious, you can just Google, hey, what's the difference be between percent %d and percent %i? You'll get a bunch of different articles explaining. Um, one more thing that I'll show you with printf is that you can actually print multiple variables in the same formatted string. So it's a formatted string because there's always one string um, and the string is the string that's going to be printed. So um, let's just say, hey, letter of the day is percent %c, temp is percent %d. I can actually do, I can actually do both. What does this mean? I need to give it in the correct order, the different variables. So my favorite letter, comma, you know, the next thing, um, the temperature. I save this, I don't forget my semicolon. I save, I compile, and what do I do? I run, um, and we should see the letter of the day is S and the temp is 14, all coming out in one string. So you can think of these sort of percent things as the placeholders or the slots in the string that the computer will fill in with the variables. Okay. Oh, that's exactly what we're showing here. That's cool. Um, we haven't done a double. Let's speed do it. Let's speed code up a double. I want to store a double. I'm going to call it a double. I'm going to call the variable my double. Why? Because that's what I want to call it. Can I declare and initialize a variable on the same line? I absolutely can. My double is going to be 20.56. There you go. I've made, um, I've made a variable called my double and assigned 20.56. Let's say I want to print out um, that double out and I just want to print the number. I don't really care. 
So I print some string. I'm going to print out my double. And you say, Jake, you've not shown me what that character um, I need to use for a double is. What do I do? You know, well, we're all intelligent humans. We can do some research and we say, okay, how to print a double in, um, in C. I do that, print a double value in C. Let's, let's check this out. Looks like a bit of a weird website, but it does the job percent F. Um, okay, well, why don't we try it? I, I put a percent F here. I'll put a backslash in, I'll save it. I'll compile it, I'll run it. Um, and we get that 20.56. Interestingly, actually, this one's a bit interesting. I only typed 20.56, but I got 20.560000 getting printed. That's because when we store a double, um, that's the amount of precision it always stores. We can't actually sort of get around it. Um, so that's what, that's what's going to happen. But here we've spoken about characters, ints and doubles. We've shown some different ways to create um, and declare memory, to store into, uh, values in that memory and to print that memory out. So remember, if you're always unsure about, um, about how to do something, um, always Google as your friend, uh, programmers live on Stack Overflow. All right, we've spoken about that. Um, okay, we haven't spoken about input, but it is halfway through the lecture. Maybe I've gone a bit too slow, that's fine. Let's take a um, five minute break, come back and talk about how we can actually read values in from the terminal. So the opposite, sort of the opposite of printf, um, how do we read? Um, in C, this is called scanf. Um, we're going to talk about that um, after at five past four. Cool. Okay, fine. I forgot that we had a question. I'll leave this up.
Okay, yep. Um, ignore my <coughs> mysterious index. Um, all right. Hopefully you all enjoyed the boudoir riddle. Um, all right. I think this is where we were up to. I wanted to talk about, um, once again, if you're not sure about which character to use for, um, for printing, I thought I had a table here. Yep. Um, here's a handy little table, small sound. Yeah, you're right. Here's a handy little table, um, with, um, you know, that you can use just to reference. Um, although this doesn't have long float Shrey. Maybe Shrey can come up with a better table somewhere actually, but if you ever need to check, um, uh, you know, which one you should be using for what you can come up to a, a table like this, um, use the percent character and then use, um, the correct letter. Shrey was just telling me that for, um, to, to print the full, um, value of a double out, what we actually want to use is a long float. I think what this is going to do, if we save this, compile and run it, is just double the amount of, um, character does it get printed? Although it looks like it's done the exact same thing. So maybe Shrey can, can um, clarify what's going on with that. Okay, we have a lot to get through. Let's close that. Let's go here. How do we read um, values into the terminal? Um, we use scanf and really interestingly is that it works um, really similarly to printf. Um, so you can see in this example here, we give it the format specifier, so long float or percent %d or character, for example. And then we just give it the name of the variable that we want to put that value that we're reading into. Um, and we that's contained in this function called scanf. This is really cool. This is where we can start doing some really cool things. So if, let's delete this line. If I'm running my program and someone else is running this program, their favorite letter is not going to be the character J, it could be whatever it is um, that, they, that they like. So instead of assigning it, you know, this hard coded or literal value um, for the character J, we can actually call this scanf function. If we look back at our slides, <clears throat> how does scanf work? We give it the format and the variable that we want to put it into. So the format is going to be a percent %c for a character. And what variable do we want to store this into? Whoops, I should not be doing it like this. Um, we call scanf. We want to read in a character and we want to put the character into um, a variable. Um, my favorite letter. Now, why have we just put this ampersand here? Um, that's we're going to go into that in more detail in future weeks, but basically um, you can sort of think of it as that I want to open up that, that um, variable for, to put, you know, this, this value into the identifier that follows. We are sort of brushing over this. We'll talk about it in the future. So let's break this down again, read in a character called C from the terminal and put it into this variable. What that means is that when we run the rest of the program, my favorite letter, um, is actually going to be printed out, but it's going to be different depending on what I type in. So we save the file, we compile the file. Um, once again, I've forgotten my semicolon. That's the theme of the day. We compile the program, we run the program, and it's actually, it looks frozen, right? It's not, it's not doing anything. It's just stuck. It's not stuck, actually. It's, um, it's waiting for me to enter my character. It's, it's, it's over here on this line. So I'm going to put in the lowercase letter J this time, because that's my favorite letter. I hit enter oh, and the program completed. Hey, my favorite letter is the letter J. Why is it the letter J? Because that's what I entered. I can run the program again. I don't have to compile it again. It's pause. I'm going to put the letter S and this time the letter S is getting printed. How cool is that? Um, so now it's depending on when I run the program, it's putting something different into my variable. I can do that with doubles, with integers. Um, you know, we can do it with temperature as well. So scanf 
percent d for an integer or a decimal integer um, put it into the temperature um, variable and that let's get rid of this line otherwise it'll always just override it to line 14 and something that's really nice when we deal with um, scanf is to actually prompt the user for the input so I'm going to do a printf enter the temperature um, and then I'm going to do one here as well printf enter your favorite letter Notice on these two examples, I did not put a new line character, um, but I'm going to put a space actually, and you'll see why in just a moment. We save, um, we compile, and we run, and you can see, okay, now it's printing. It's executing line 10. Print your favorite, uh, enter your favorite letter. I'm going to put a G this time. Enter the temperature. I'm going to put a 20. And you can see that um, it's a nice 20 degrees the, le the letter of the day is G and the temperature is 20. So we're, we're reading in these values and we're printing out these values. Okay, um, Connor, if you want your favorite letter is N, you can write this program yourself, execute it and type in the character M um, and be the, and, and, and have as much fun with it as, you, as you'd like. So for decimals, we use LF, for integers, we use D, for characters, we use C. Okay. Um, so we've spoken about scanf for characters. All right, a different type of um, memory, a different type of storage. We have called these variables, why? They're containers of um, data um, that can change. You saw I, I, I can set it, an integer to 14 and then reassign it to 20. They, they're, they're, they're just these containers that can change values all the time. But some values actually never change. And it doesn't actually make much sense to ask for some storage that can change if we're never actually changing it. So programs have these ideas called constants. Um, they're like variables, except they can't be changed and they never change. The way we declare them is also a little bit different. Um, we use this thing called hash define and um, um, we always name our constants in upper caps, upper cases, so that we always know that it is a constant that we're dealing with. So I declare my constants at the top of the program, um, usually above any of the functions, and I can just say hash define um, that the, the, the character pi is 3.1415. Okay, this is gonna trip a lot of you up. It does for me sometimes too. Um, you don't put a semicolon after hash defines um, because of the way they worked. We can talk about the way um, in which constants actually work and how it's different to variables. So why you don't put the semicolon there um, at some point in the future. But we can use them um, just as just how we use um, any other variable, basically. So I can print, um, instead of printing this double, I can just print pi here. Um, and instead of printing whatever else, well, 20.56, it should just print out um, 3.145. It's telling me, hey, you're not actually using this variable called my double. Yep, you're correct. Um, let's put the letter A for number 12. And it prints out this long um, um, value 3.141500 um, because that's that's the pi that I defined. And so that's what a constant is. The difference is I can't change pi. I can't say pi is equal to a different number now. That won't be allowed by the compiler. Okay. So... We have these, um, we can read values in. We want to do, let's do stuff to these values. And some of the common things we do with numbers is we um, do some arithmetic on them. So we can add numbers together, um, subtract numbers together, multiply numbers, um, etc. cetera. Um, so let's do that. So why don't we simplify some of this? Let's delete this here. Um, let's not 
Um, let's delete this. Let's call this temperature underscore one. And let's make a separate temperature, temperature underscore two. Um, let's get rid of the double. Let's keep the double. Let's keep the double for now, but not do anything with it. Whoops. Um, all right, enter, let's say enter temperature one, enter temperature two. Um, this is going to be a percent D because we're <clears throat> reading in a temperature. I copy this, I'm gonna paste this here. I'm gonna put temperature two here. So now what we've got some code to do is to read in temperature one and read in temperature two. Now, let's create another temperature called temperature sum. It's an integer. Now, what I want temperature sum to be is the result of not just temperature one or not just temperature two, um, the the evaluation of the expression temperature one plus temperature two. So let's break down this line a little bit. What's gonna happen here? Well, remember what, what, what have I said a few times when we come across a line like this? What's the first thing that the program does? What's the first thing the program's going to do when it gets to this line? Daniel says, check the variables. Um, Ron Rick says, make some memory. It's actually already got the memory, so it's all good with that. It got the memory up here. Not when the program runs, Joe, when this line runs, this line 20, just this line 20. It actually does more than one thing. The first, it always goes to the assignment statement. It always goes to the assignment statement first. And it says, what's the thing on the right hand side of the assignment statement? Now, in this case, it's actually more than one thing. It's, it's, it's a few things. There's these two variables and there's this plus character. So it has to figure out what this value actually is. And so how does it do that? Well, it goes to the assignment statement. And then it says, what's on the left of the assignment statement? Add it to the right of the assignment statement. Now, I don't know what's in the left of the assignment statement yet because I haven't run the program, but we know it's going to evaluate it. So it's going to add them together and put that result in temperature sum, which means, um, let's just get rid of this. Let's make this a percent D and let's print out temperature sum. So what it should do is read in these two numbers, add them together, store that in a third variable called temperature sum and print it out. I save the file, I compile and I execute it. It's gonna ask me for the temperature one, I'm gonna put 20. It's gonna ask me for temperature two, I'm gonna put 15. And so we should see 35 get printed out. How cool is this? We're reading values in, we're storing them, we're doing arithmetic on those values and then we're printing them out. The basic arithmetic we can do, we can add, we can subtract, we can multiply, we can divide. These usually happen in their normal mathematical order um, and we can use brackets if we want to force precedence. Um, so change the order of expression. Um, you know, so we could do something like, we could do something cool. We could calculate the average of the temperature on the two days, but there's some caveats we need to, to think about here. So first of all, we read the two numbers in, that's no problem. I'm gonna change, yeah, let me just delete this. I'm gonna change this temperature sum to be temperature average. But um, the average of two integers can be a floating point, can't it? So I actually need to change this to a double. How do I compute the average of two values? Well, I do actually add them together, so we're sort of already there. Um, I'm renaming this to average. I wanna add the two numbers up and then divide them by the number of variables, which is two. But we actually have a problem here. The problem is that um, division always happens before addition. 
So it's going to do temperature to divide to plus temperature run. Joe has just typed bracket um, and that's absolutely correct. We want to do one plus two, or we want to add the two variables together first and then divide that result by two um, and then print that out. And again, we want to print out average here, not the sum. I compile this, oops. Oh, okay. This is a great example of an, a small error that I've made that the compiler has picked up for me. It's saying, hey, you're printing out this double, but you told me you're printing out an integer. So I need to tell it, oh, you're right, compiler. All right, I yield, compiler, you got me this time. I am printing out a, um, a double. When I compile it this time, I get no, 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 no warnings. And when I execute the program, ask for me the temp one, let's just put 20, let's just put 20. And the average of two temperatures at the, at the temperature 20 is obviously going to be 20. So you can see we can do some cool, really cool arithmetic. And already you should be thinking, okay, I can do some cool things with this program. Um, you know, I can read numbers in, do some calculations at the speed that a computer can execute them and print out the result to my user. Um, Anubu has asked how, what if I just wanted to print only the first few decimal places? Um, we can do that. Um, and the way we do that, I'm just reading, um, we have to find the syntax for it. You do, is it point two? Is this right? Shrey just told me earlier. Point two LF. So to the, to the precision of two decimal places, um, I'll save that. I'll run it. 20, 20, and then you, you can see here it's capped it at two rather than the, the six that were coming out earlier. So I'm changing the way, but it, all it's doing is changing the format that it's printed out at. Um, it's not changing the memory that's actually stored. Okay. I'm gonna skip that slide. It's got something, you know, I mentioned that characters are just integers. That means we can actually um, add one and subtract, subtract one to them, but it's a little bit weird to sort of do that, but it is completely possible. Some quirks about integers, some, some fun facts. Um, I mentioned integers can store values in the range of negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion, but this does not mean that the real world does not do things that tick over that $2 billion, uh, two, not $2 billion, that would be nice, that 2 billion figure. Um, so here's a couple of examples, but a really, uh, you might actually remember this Gangnam Style, that, that hit video on YouTube. Um, when YouTube was originally programmed, they never imagined that a, a video could have more than 2 billion views. So they used an integer variable to store um, the number of likes on the video or the number of views, I think, sorry. Um, but what happened when that number ticked over that one, that 2 billion value, um, something went wrong. What actually went wrong is called an overflow. So it overflowed the amount of, um, bits that could, could fit. And so something goes, goes quite wrong. Um, this can actually lead to some pretty devastating accidents, let's say, if, if a programmer makes this sort of mistake. Okay. And I mentioned that if you divide two integers, you get back a double, right? Because, you know, the, it just, that's how um, it could be evaluated. It might not be a full number. Okay. That was the stretch video. All right. Another concept we need to talk about today, um, that's really important is, um, that so far our programs always did um, um, the, the exact same um, execution every time we, we ran the code. So, whoops, let's go back to, to here. Every time I run this program, even though it lets me type different values in, um, it's doing the exact same instructions every single time. What control flow lets us do or if statements is make decisions based on some state um, in our program. And so the way we can do this in C is using the if statement. The best way to think about it an if statement is to, to understand that there has to be a yes or a no to tell the if statement um, whether to do path A or path B. Um, 
So as an example, is a number even? Is one la number larger than the other number? Um, and the syntax for the if statement is as follows. First, we have to have some condition that evaluates to true or false. That's what we have here. And then we have some block that runs some code if that condition was true. So only if the condition is true, does the code get run. If the condition is not true, the code does not get run. Let's, let's code that up. We have some values in, sure, we can just use them like that. We get the average, okay, that's fine. Um, let's say if the average is greater than 20, I just wanna print something out to the terminal, but only if the average is greater than 20. So I can say if, brackets here, and now I need some um, expression that evaluates to either true or false. So in this case, I can just refer back to my temperature average. So read the value in this memory. I don't know what it is yet, but read the value in this memory. And if it's greater than 20, okay? So that's the greater than statement. If the value on the left is greater than the value on the right, do something. If it's not, don't do anything. What is it gonna do? I'm just for now, I'm gonna say print F. Um, um, all I'm going to do actually is to say, yes, the temperature, the average was higher than 20. Uh, I'll put my backslash N in there. Save that. Let's just get rid of this. I can comment it out. So now it gets ignored by the compiler, right? So I read two numbers in, I calculate the average. If that average is over than 20, I'm just saying that the average was over than, greater than 20. I compile that, I'm gonna clear my terminal, I'm gonna run it, it's gonna ask for my two numbers. Let's get um, a high, a pretty, whoops. Did I run this? Oh, did I not run it? Enter temp one, I'm gonna put 40. Enter temp two, I'm gonna put 40 as well. Yes, the average was higher than 20. That makes a lot of sense. Let's run it again. I'm gonna put 10 and 10. What's gonna happen now? When I hit enter. Yeah, maybe this is some political statement about climate change. Oh, someone said an error. Interesting. Someone said nothing. Morgan says just the average. Nothing, nothing. Let's think about it. I entered 10. I entered 10. I added them together. 20 divided 2 is 10. Is... 10 greater than 20, no. So this does not run. What's the next thing that runs? Just this return zero, which is um, what quits the program. So when I hit enter, the program quits and nothing gets executed. There's no error. Um, it just returns zero to indicate that the program has completed. But what if I do wanna do something in the other case? So if the temperature is less than or equal to 20, we can use this else statement, okay? So obviously just in the opposite case. Um, how does this work? We just immediately following the if statement. I have no condition here because it's just the opposite case of when the temperature is greater than 20. Um, and I can just print here, the temp is lower than 20, I've set or equal. Okay. I save the file. Whoops. Yep. Don't know why that's highlighted. I'll run that. I'm gonna just put, um, yeah, I'm gonna put lower again so that we should see, yeah. That, that that secondary evaluation gets gets printed, but never will both of these lines get printed in the same program execution. Um, amazing music, how do I get the shortcut? I think you're talking about when I put the, when I'm clicking the up, the up character, the up key on my keyboard, it's cycling through my previous commands. 
So Nicole says, but wouldn't it display the temperature or lower even if the average is 20? That's a great question. We've got to be very precise here. If the temperature is greater than 20, this will execute. If it's exactly 20, and we can test that, we can just do two 20s, it's saying it's lower than 20 or equal because 20 is not greater than 20, it is exactly 20. So it does not execute. What if I wanted to be greater than or equal to 20? I can say greater than or equal to 20. Um, this is the, the, the sequence of characters that means greater than or equal to. So, um, oops, I'm gonna just clear. I'm going to compile this. Um, I'm going to run it. Um, and I'm gonna put exactly 20. And now, greater than or equal to 20, it is exactly equal to 20. So I can put the temperature was higher than 20. Okay. What about if something is not true in the first case? Um, it's still not true in the second case. Like how, can I have multiple cases? Like exactly, Pravin, how many if else's can we have? You can actually have, um, you can actually have a lot. Um, we can chain them. But the key is you can only ever have one else statement without a condition. So I can say else if the temperature average, I can say is exactly equal to 20. I can say printf, well, exactly 20. Um, and then I can get rid of this part here because that's not the case anymore. Um, So now what do we have? If the temperature is greater than 20, say it's greater than 20. If it's exactly 20, it's exactly 20. If it's anything else, well, it must be lower. Okay. I run this. Um, I'm gonna just do exactly 20 again. Wow, it's exactly 20. I run it again. I'm gonna do 10 and 10. It's lower than 20. I run it again. Let's do 30. 25, it's going to be higher than 20. And we can have as many of these if, else, if, else, if, and then a single else at the end if we need that single else. Now, we need to be careful here. This is where programming, we need to be quite precise. Two, two equals symbols is an equivalency check. A single equal symbol is an assignment operator. So they look really similar. It might be easier to make a mistake. However, um, they're doing completely different things. One of them is checking that the right-hand side, side equals the left-hand side. Um, and one of them is assigning the value from the right to the variable on the left. Okay. Here is a table of um, a few different options that we have. Less than, that makes sense. It's the opposite of greater than. Less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, that also makes some sense because double equals is equal to. Um, so you can sort of put those together. And then we have not equals to, which is exclamation mark um, equals symbol. Um, these are very universal um, operations. They exist in most programming languages and they mean the same thing in most programming languages. All of these must evaluate to true or false. A number is either greater than another number or it's not. A number is either equal to another number or it's not. So all of these will result in a zero if it's false or a one if it's true. That's actually how we represent true or false um, in our programs. It's either a one or a zero. Um, no, Pravin, you can't swap it around. So you can't go equal, you can't do um, for example, you can't do this. This doesn't mean anything in, in, in C, or if it does, it doesn't mean um, greater than or equal to. Um, Elvin Seed says, what if you want a false outcome? That's actually a good question. So I think you mean, what if I want the opposite? So um, what if I want temperature greater than 20, not temperature greater than 20? There's a few ways we can do it. Um, we can just say less than, that's going to swap it. Another thing we can do is actually wrap this in some braces and use an exclamation mark here. So this is saying, is the temperature greater than 20? It might be yes, let's say. 
Okay, let's flip it. So now it will be false. Um, but in this case, that would not be very good code. We would just say, you know, less than or equal to 20. That's the opposite in this case. And that's more readable, right? Okay. Oop, what just happened there? We can, yeah, we have some examples here. Is 12 less than or equal to 12? In this case, yes, it is. Is eight not equal to eight? Um, so is eight not equal to eight? That's false. Um, and is five less than 10? What do you all think? Yes, no, yes. Yeah, well put, Nicole. Yeah, um, okay. Someone asked, can we use if else statements in procedures and call them in the main function? Absolutely. That's, that's a great question, actually. Anubov, we can, we can put these anywhere. Um, we can put this, all, I mean, in, if you think about it, this is in a function called main, um, but all of this is, is C code that can go anywhere. Good question. Okay. All right. Sometimes you actually want to chain your conditions. So you want to check if two things are true at the same point um, in the same moment. And there's a few ways that we can do this. We can use and, or we can use or, or we can use not. Do we have more examples here? Yes, we do. So let's look at the first example. Um, I like what Nickel did. So if you can put um, like true, false, true, or true, true, false, or false, 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 put in what you think your answers are um, to all three of these. So is seven less than 15? That's false. And is eight greater than or equal to 15? That's also false. So false and false is false. Therefore, the first answer is false. So the double ampersand means um, you and what's on the left and what's on the right. What's actually kind of interesting is that for this to be true, both would need to be true. So if the first case is false, I don't even actually check the second because I know it will never be true. I don't, that's probably a weird sentence to hear, but... Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Double pipe. At least I call this character pipe. I don't know if it actually is called that. Um, is an or statement. So if either the first thing or the second thing are true, then the whole thing will be true. Um, so is seven less than 15 true? Um, is eight greater than or equal to 15 false? However, only one of these needs to be true. So the whole thing is true. So, so far it should be false true. And here we have a bit of a complicated one. So let's break it down. Is five less than 10 true? That means I don't actually have to check the second hand side because it's an or statement. Only one of them needs to be true. So this part from the brackets in the brackets is true, but then the not operator nots it. So it should actually be false. So it should be, I think it was false, true, false. And that's what Kathy's got. That's what Nathan's got. That's what Dwayne's got. Um, yeah. All right. Let's put all of this to the test. What we're going to do here is write a program together um, that is going to sort of combine a lot of these different um concepts into one program. Um, yeah, I know all of you are saying that this this um, exclamation mark is confusing. Um, it can be, it can be. And it's a bit of practice to, to sort of get used to it. But, um, you know, you've got to just take it slow, get a piece of paper, pen and paper out um, and, and break it down. Um, Manusha, no, we don't have else if, but we have else space if, but it's not a single um, statement. All right. Let's stretch for a second. All right, we're gonna solve, we're gonna write a program together. A user rolls two dice and tells us the number on each of the rolled die. Um, our programs will, our program, maybe you can write along in the next 20 minutes, is gonna add the two numbers together and check them against a target number that only we know, only the program knows. It will then report back whether the total of the dice was higher, equal or lower 
than the second number. All right, so there's a few things we need to break down here. And you can start to sort of appreciate and understand that when we need to solve problems, we need to make sure we know exactly what we're trying to do and, and try and break it down. So how do we break it down? Well, we can write a set of pseudo instructions to help us think about it. So first of all, the user rolls two dice. We don't have to worry about that. That's done outside of our program. We read the result of each dice. So how do we read the input? Everyone, how do we read input from a user in terminal? Scanf, exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly what we were doing with the temperature, scanf. So we know we can do that. All right, then we need to add the two numbers together. I think we know how to do that. We can use the plus operator. Perfect, we're happy. Check them against the target number. I think we can do that. We can use um, sort of these statements here, right? To check if the numbers are greater than or less than or equal to. Excuse me, we can do that. Um, and then we're just printing out some statements. I think we can do that too. All right, so I think we have all the building blocks um, necessary to complete this program. Well, here we've broken it down even a bit more with even a bit more pseudocode. Read the numbers one and two in, add the numbers together. We have to define the target number. I did forget about that. Um, and then we can break it down. Okay. We have about 20 minutes. I would really encourage you all to um, follow along with me um, if you can, if you're at a computer and you can do that. Um, so switch over to VLab, open the terminal, open a new file. We're gonna call it Dice Checker. So we're gonna make a new program here um, and feel free to follow along with the lecture coding or you can find the, the code as I save it in, in the environment. All right, so I'm gonna clear my terminal. I'm actually gonna close this file. I don't want it anymore. It's gone. I'm gonna close this. So um, White asks, is there a way to get the C file back from a compiled one? Absolutely. We never destroy the C file. We take the C file and generate um, a program. Now in this case, I'm not gonna rename my program. I'm gonna make a new program. So gedit, open my gedit editor. Um, and I'm going to edit a file, a new file. I'm going to call it dicechecker.c. Um, and then remember the ampersand to continue on my terminal environment, which sometimes doesn't work perfectly anyway. All right. Terminal here, text editor here. This is looking good. Let's get this looking nice. Um, okay, it's a bit fiddly. That's all right. Um, can Tammy or someone um, link the lecture code directory as I make the file? Okay. All right. What's the first thing I do when I write a C program? I need to put the boilerplate code. And um, we always need an int main that accepts nothing um, and it returns zero. All C programs need the main function. I know that I wanna do some printing and reading here. So I need to import standard io.h as well. Okay, there's a really basic boiler code, boilerplate um, program. Let's say the first thing we, we wanna do is actually print some instructions out to the user. So I could put the instructions in my main function here or to make, make it a bit nice and clean, I'm gonna make a procedure, right? So procedures don't return anything. It's gonna just print some instructions. So that's exactly what I'm gonna call it. And it's just gonna make some printf statements. Printf, um, welcome to my dice game. Backslash n, printf, in this game, you will roll two dice. Then I'll sum them and tell you how far you were off. So I've grouped my instructions in this print instructions um, procedure. And if I want to write those instructions out, I need to call print instructions. 
When we're writing programs, it doesn't matter if it's a small program like Hello World or a really big program um, that when you're working in a few years, it's really good to um, write code, build, build the program and compile um, the program as you go. So how do I compile this program? Remember DCC, dice checker, dash O, um, I'm just gonna call the program dice. I hit enter and I get no warning because I wrote correct C code, that feels good. Let's run it. And you can see um, we get the three instructions getting printed out from this print instructions um, procedure. I've just been told that the lecture code files aren't don't have the right permission. I can fix this really quickly. You don't have to know exactly what I'm doing here. Um, but this is just so that you can read what I've done. Okay, on the directory. All right, sorry about that. All right, we have a bunch of files here. Um, all right, if we go back to our slides, um, the first thing I need to do, take the result of each die. So we need to read some values. How do I read some values? Well, first of all, I need to make some variables. So int dice underscore one, int dice underscore two. Done. Now I need to read some values into those variables. How do I do that? I want to put into dice one the result of calling scanf on a, dec on a, uh, a long uh, a decimal integer into dice one. What do I want to do if I'm going to scan? Um, it's probably a good idea to print f um, the instructions. So enter dice one. All right. I can copy this and re and paste it because what I want to do next is actually really similar, and I just want to enter dice two and scan that value into dice two. Again, when we write code, it's really good, it's really important to save, build, and compile. Um, let's not worry about that. Um, often as you go. I'm getting a bunch of warnings here. It looks quite scary. It's just telling me that I'm not actually using these variables yet. Um, so they're just some warnings. Um, so we can sort of ignore it for now. All right. So we've entered, we've read some two numbers in. Next instruction, add the two values together and sum them up. All right. So that means I need another variable called sum. And I want it to be an integer because the sum of two integers is probably going to be an integer. Um, and I just say the sum is assigned the result of taking dice one and adding dice two, semicolon. I save this, um, I clear this, I compile this, I get the same sort of warnings, but we don't worry about it right now. Um, and I'm not really printing any, oh, I can, I can run it. Um, I get my instructions, enter dice one, I can just put a number in there. Um, Oh yeah, I forgot actually. Remember when we scan, we need the ampersand um, to sort of tell the program that um, I want to put some data in, inside of the variable. So this is why it's really good to build and compile and execute often um, so that I you know, can pick up my mistakes as I go. When I execute it this time, that looks much better. Enter dice one, I can put the number 12. Enter dice two, I can put the number five. And then that's it, it's not really doing anything else, but that's okay. We wanna then check this sum. Um, so Amazing Music has asked, you know, why don't we use this ampersand sometimes? We always use it for scanf. It's just not printf um, that we wanna use it for. Okay. Check that the number um, check the sum against a target number. Um, and if it's greater, we'll do something. If it's equal, we'll do something. If it's less than, we'll do something. All right. So that's going to happen down here. I need to check the value of the sum. So I can say if, well, what, what we want to 
excuse me, what do we want to do first? Maybe we'll say if they get the number exactly right. So if the sum is equal to, now we haven't actually picked our magic number yet. So we want to pick a number between like two and 12, I think. Um, I'm actually going to make this a constant. Let's call it, let's do that. We could make it a variable, but it's not, I don't really want it to change. I'm going to define my um, answer and it's going to be, I'm going to put four, no semicolon. I always wanted to type a semicolon there. 12, I mean, you can, when you write this, you can put your own answer in, you can change it. All right, save. If the sum, that means if the sum is equal to answer, what do we want, what do we want to say if it's exactly the same? We can do a printf, hey, you got it. And save that. All right, let's clear this. Let's compile it. Remember, it's always good to compile our programs as we go. Notice here, the warnings disappeared because now I'm actually using those variables. Um, and when I execute the dice program, um, cool. In this game, we'll roll two dice. If I'll sum them, tell you how far you're off. Let's put, um, let's, let's do it so that it's four. So if I do two and then two, whoop, that's really cool. Hey, you got it. Um, I can put my backslash in there. So it's nice and on a new line um, and I'm happy. All right. Now we need to deal with the case that uh, the sum is less than answer. How do we do that? Well, else if the sum is less than answer, we can just say, we can say like, ooh, not quite, a bit higher. All right, I'm gonna, oh, that actually, now I've made an error here. This shouldn't be else, this should be else if, because there's still a condition here. Um, and then finally, we could do an else if here, but we can actually just do an elf else, because if a number's not exactly the same and it's not less than it, it has to be higher than it. So we actually don't need to have an if statement here. Um, we can just print, um, ooh, again, a bit too high and save that. All right, so we've read the, we read the values in, we sum them together and then we check, is it the same? Is it less than? Otherwise, which means it must be greater than, we can compile this program, run the program, and now no matter what I do here, I can put two and then four. Okay, that's six, six is greater than four, so it's saying, oh, a bit too high. I can run it again, load some different values into memory. Oop, still a bit too high. If I go, you know, one and then one, I need to go higher, it's telling me that, it's looking good. Um, and if I want to go four and four, no, what was it again? What was my answer? Two, okay. So I can do one and then three, for example. Hey, you got it. Cool. And that is, I think, exactly what we want to do um, in this program. How exciting. A few questions I noticed in the chat. Um, Why don't we tell a constant what type it is? It's a really good question. The answer is a little complicated. It's a bit of an efficiency thing. Um, it's actually sort of treating um, the value answer as a literal for. It's like doing a copy and replace. Um, we can talk, I think my VLAB is just completely frozen. Well, I mean, it's very good that the, oh, VLAB crashed. That's hilarious. Let's attempt to reconnect. Okay, maybe we're back. I mean, it was not bad timing. <laughs> um, um, okay, I need to just G edit. Um, public HTML, lecture comp 151, lecture code, week one, ampersand, no, oh no, whoops, 
I didn't give it the file. Um, dice checker.c ampersand. There we go. Okay, we're back. Um, now I've forgotten what I was talking about. Oops. Okay, some questions. Um, the computer just said no, yep. How would we stop someone putting something that isn't a number into the program? That's a great question that we'll talk about in the future. Yeah, I, I really love how you're all sort of thinking and exploring, you know, how could this break? How could this work? Um, we'll be talking a lot about this um, in the future. How do we, if we need to change the number? Well, if, in this case, I could just change the constant, but I would have to recompile it and rerun it. Um, that's okay. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm going to, we've done that. All right. I'm going to end on this, um, at the end of every lecture, maybe at the end of every week's lecture. So after the Wednesday lecture, um, I encourage you to scan this QR code or go to the URL at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can just leave some lecture feedback. Um, you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, if there's anything small that could be improved or something like that. Um, so go ahead. I'll give you a few minutes to scan this QR code before we finish off the lecture. Um, maybe someone in the, one of the admins can um, post the URL in the chat. So I'll give you all a moment on that. Hopefully some of you were able to um, follow along. Um, okay. Okay, yep, okay, URL's there. For the assignment, um, assignment zero, step one is releasing today. How exciting. When you see it, you're gonna be really um, happy and comfortable. It's, it's a really simple, um, assignment. All it's designed to do is to make sure that you're getting up to speed with how to get the assignments and all of that sort of stuff. So um, assignment zero is coming out today. Stay tuned. We'll make an announcement out and put out the um, uh, the URL that you can visit to get the actual assignment. Um, the assignment's due, I think, in week four. Um, but this is only one sort of part of the assignment. We're releasing them in nice consumable chunks. Um, in terms of the time, you'll get an email when, when it's actually available. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's due in week four, but you should be getting started on it um, basically straight away. But it's a really straightforward assignment. Okay. So we've got the lecture form, the feedback forms out. The assignment's coming out today. We wrote some code together. We're starting already. It's only week one. Um, and we're already starting to get some some sort of cool programs together where we can read values, write values, um, do some arithmetic on values, and we can actually do different things depending on certain circumstances in our code. Um, yes, red pumpkins, all the assignment stages are due at the same time. So assignment zero, the whole thing is due in week four. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. All right. Otherwise, it's exactly 5 p.m. I hope you are able to follow along um, with the code at home. If you weren't, that's completely fine. Like I mentioned, this code's available um, on the lecture code URL. However, um, what I would suggest is that you try and implement it yourself. The best way to learn programming is to do programming. So even though we've given you out the solution, um, you could, maybe you could think about challenging yourself. Someone mentioned, which I thought was an excellent idea. Can I tell the user how far away they were from the destination answer? That's a great thing that you could think about coding in, um, as a good sort of challenge to yourself. But otherwise we have the tute labs that you, you've got coming up or you've already done this week. Assignment zero is out today. So there's plenty to do. 
Thank you so much for uh, today's lecture. Thank you so much to the to the moderators and to the tutors um, in the chat. Um, thank you all so much. Have a great, I'll see you on Tuesday next week. Um, thank you all so much um, and I'll see you soon. Remember forum for questions, do some coding, get your hands dirty, assignment zero, you got this.